how good, how true that is. I hope today our trust is in Christ. And if you will, open your Bible to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 8 is what we're going to look at today. Uh, we very in-depthly look at verse 3, but we'll real briefly read it again to get us context for the whole of what we're going to read today as well. You can entitle the message today, Get This Hour, um, Counting Our Blessings in Christ. Again, this is Thanksgiving season, and, and what better book for us to study than the book of Ephesians. Again, in this first part of this chapter, what do we see? We see, get this, all of the blessings, the great grace, the intense riches that God had prepared ahead of time to pour out to all of those who would trust in Christ. And my friend, what great blessings these are. And I pray that we see these today. This is the whole point of this whole chapter. Get this, is to more clearly see what we have in Christ, more clearly see who we are in Christ, then that we may live out the plans that he has for us in Christ. So if you will, um, we're going to read Ephesians 1, 3 through 8, and then we'll bow in a word of prayer and then jump into the text. It says here, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love, having predestinated us into the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to Himself according to the good pleasure of His will, to the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He hath made us accepted in the Beloved, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace, wherein He hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. If you will, let's bow to the Lord in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we do come to you today. We come to you, one resting and trusting in your Son, Jesus Christ. We have heard your great gospel. We have um, repented of our sins and asked Jesus to save our soul. We stand also in his name, praying in his name today. We pray to you, thanking you for who you are, for what you have done and who you will always be. We thank you today as we have already read just nugget of, of riches after nugget of riches. These amazing things that you have given us through your Son. But we come to you now also praying that through the Holy Spirit you would teach us to understand this wisdom, understand this truth, understand and fully grasp these, or at least better grasp these riches that we have in Him. But may we leave here more thankful. May we leave here abounding in your riches May we leave here closer to you. May we leave here more sold out to living your great plan that you have for us. But if there's anyone here today, it is your desire that none perish but all repent. You desire that all would be saved. And we pray that that would happen. Please be with me in the teaching and the preaching, but again, all of us, that we would open our understanding to see in your truth and it is in your son's precious name we do pray. Amen. Again, if you will, we look now at Ephesians 1. We'll go briefly back through verse 3. But remember again, as we read verse 3, know that this is the key verse for this passage. It's going to lay a groundwork that will tell you what all of the verses to follow are, are all about. Um, and I'll read it, but... Again, it will end with that phrase, in Christ. And what's interesting is pretty much every one of these verses that we're going to unfold and dissect this morning 
Again, all of these are related to that phrase, and many of them will repeat that phrase again. In Christ, in the beloved, in the loved, in, in Him. So again, know this, that all of these riches that we're going to look at today, that God had, God the Father, had already planned and in store for us, He again is giving those to us because we are in Christ. Because He has shared that great gospel, He drew us through His Holy Spirit, He convicted us, and we received Christ as Savior. And now that we are in Christ, we have been given everything. Amen? So if you will, let's briefly look through three and then dissect the rest that is to come. If you will, verse 3 says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So again, all praise, all blessing and glory be to God the Father who did this. Um, who again is Father and God of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Again, what this is starting out with again is this. Let us give praise to God for everything that He has given us through Christ. And as we get this, each verse to come, as we dissect what we have been given, let us have a praising and thankful heart to God because He has freely given this of His great grace through Christ and through Christ alone. Amen? So think about this. Verse 4 now as it says. It says according, here's some of these, just some of these spiritual blessings that He has given you and me. One of them is this, according as He, he has chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. Think about this, what is it saying? Um, first of all, just bring this to light to begin with, is that it is drawing out His plan. And we're going to have to go deeper into this in a minute because we're going to have to look at more text throughout Scripture. Because what we have, what we have brought to light today is this word of, of chosen, this word of predestinate, uh, predestination. But what we must do, and we're about to do it, is we can't just look at those words at face value and then one, we can't do this. What ideas that men have come up with throughout the ages and theologies that men has assigned to those words, we can't just buy them and say, okay, that must mean what, that must be what God is meaning here. No. What you and I are responsible for doing is we don't take man's word for it. What we do is we must be diligent to study out this verse within its passage and one, see what it's saying there. But then all other interpretations of the Bible, all theologies or, or possible interpretations of the Bible that man may have, get this, you must always Compare it to the whole counsel of God. Amen? Because my friend, if we have this word and we attribute a meaning to this word and get this, if it goes against the rest of the nature of God that has been revealed to us throughout His whole word, then that theology is false. It must line up with what the whole of the Bible says. Amen? If God has revealed to us that, look, my desire, my will is for this. Well, if man comes along and he has a theology about a word or about a verse, and it does not line up with the revealed desire and will of God, then their theology is wrong. Amen? So again, bear with us today as we really, again, each of these verses are packed in and of itself. But we're going to have to unfold what this word means as well. And again, you, we all have people that we love that have varying theologies, right? That may be about certain particulars in Scripture. And we love each other, but what we are held responsible to do 
is to study out text and, and conclude what is God actually saying and hold to that. Hold to what God is truly saying. So one, what do we first look at at verse four? But we're going to uh, bring these um, scriptures that I'll, I'll bring out in a minute again, seeing what the whole counsel of God has already said about his desire and will. But then also it will be related to verse four of chosen, but also of predestinated and what he has predestinated us unto in verse um, five as well. But look now, if you will, first of all, what has he chosen us unto even before the foundation of the world? Well, verse 4 of Ephesians 1 actually says, get this, that what he has chosen us unto is this, that, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Well, what does that mean? Get this, it is simply telling us, what God's amazing plan of riches are. One, he has desire to offer salvation to all. And it will be received of all who receive Christ and who would trust in Christ. And I'm going to ask you, once you have accepted Christ, do you know what happened? A lot of things happen and we're reading them. But in this verse, what happened is this is that we have been declared holy. We have been declared blameless before God. I'm just going to tell you, that is a blessing right there. That's, a, that's rich. Amen? That we, us, that are sinners, we cannot stand and live before a holy and a righteous God. Amen? He is so righteous... He is so just and he is so holy that sin cannot stand before him and that person live. Amen. We are undone before him. We are unworthy before him. We cannot live and stand before him. But get this. What he has offered to you and me in Christ is that he, Jesus, would wear our sin on the cross. That he would bear our sin on the cross. He would pay that debt. God's wrath be fully satisfied. Justice be fully dealt out for sin. And that get this, then we can wear the righteousness of Jesus. Amen. That's imputation. Jesus' righteousness, His blamelessness, His holiness, His perfection is imputed to you and me when we trust in Him. Amen. I'm just going to tell you, I can't pray to God, a holy God, I cannot approach His throne, and I would not stand before Him and live with Him in eternity apart from me trusting in Christ. Amen. We would die. We would remain separated. We would remain spiritually dead. Amen. Amen. So I'm just going to tell you, my friend, that is one of the rich blessings right there. That we can stand before him holy and blameless. Amen. He has forgiven all our sins, and we'll get there in a moment as well. But again, let's unpack a little bit of these ideas of chosen or, or predestinated. We'll get to verse 5 in just a minute. But there's an idea that is out there. I'll just go ahead and address it. You've probably heard it before, but... Again, it is, it, we are responsible for, again, there's going to be a lot of ideas and a lot of theologies that are out there in the world. And that there may be a lot of people that are solid on a lot of theological truths, but they may get this or that wrong. But what we are responsible for doing, again, is what does God say? And I've got to stick to that. So here's an idea that is out there about uh, predestination that some people would believe this, get this, that God has beforehand selected only some to receive grace, only some to trust in Christ, and only some to be saved, but that others that He has already chosen that they cannot be saved, or that they are selected for damnation, for hell. But I'm going to ask you, does that line up with the rest of the clear teachings in the Bible. I'm just going to share with you this. Again, let us hear what God says 
And then let us wrap our understanding around this. But here's the truth. My conviction is that God offers this salvation unto all who would believe. Amen? It says that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen? There's just some of them. And I won't exhaust all of them. But here's one, 1 Peter 1 and 2. It says this, Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. So one thing that we must bring out when we're trying to understand this word of predestination is you must realize that any election and predestination is done by this, the foreknowledge of God the Father. Amen? And what is that? What is the foreknowledge of God the Father? I'm just going to tell you, from the beginning of the Bible and to the end, God makes it very evidently clear that He knows everything. Amen? He knows everything. He is all-knowing. His knowledge is not, limit, is not limited. He knows everything. And one, I'll just tell you one, that teaching is clear, but uh, almost a third of this whole Bible is prophecy. So that tells me that, look, the one who revealed to us and gave to us this word, which we know it to be God, that he knew all of these events that he would give prophecy of about before they happen. Sometimes centuries before they happen, and sometimes over a thousand years, thousands of years before they happen. Amen? And that is evidently clear. And these prophecies are not generic. They are very detailed and specific. Amen? I'm just going to tell you, if we read the Bible at all, and even look at Scripture at all, our faith is not blind. It's not irrational. It would be irrational to believe that God does not exist and that this Bible's not His. And one reason being is the prophecy given in the Word of God. So again, some third of this is God saying, look, this is going to happen even before it happened. And guess what? It happens exactly how He says it's going to happen. Amen? Think about this, just bringing some remembrance back to us more about His foreknowledge. He would even tell some of His men some of his prophets that he spoke to, I knew you before you were even born. Amen? Nothing takes God by surprise. Nothing. And also what we see, even think about this, Gideon, one of the uh, judges in Israel's history, get this, God attributes a name to him, get this, while he is hiding from the enemy, God attributes a name to him, Oh, man of valor. And I don't think God was being sarcastic. I think God knew who Gideon would grow into being. Amen? And yes, he did become quite the man of valor. Amen? My point is this. The foreknowledge of God is very evidently clear. Very clear. I'll also tell you in this as well, I'm convinced too that even sin that you may commit tomorrow, guess what? It's not going to take God by surprise. And I am very convinced of this, and that's why we're looking at this predestination and, and election. I'm also convinced of this, that whether someone rejects Christ or whether someone receives Christ, Guess what we're also not doing? We're not taking God off by surprise. Amen? Think about this, and you even see uh, uh, the Scripture, uh, when the end times come, there's going to be some people approaching Jesus and saying, look, let us into your kingdom. We've done all of these good works. We've done all of these good things. But do you know what Jesus is going to tell them? Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity, I never knew you. I never knew you. So is his knowledge all, is it, is, does he have knowledge of everything? Yes. But does he personally know the lost? Is there a relationship there? No. Why? Because man has rejected it. 
And I'm just going to tell you, Jesus told him, I, I never knew you. It wasn't that this person made a profession, they really knew God, but then they, they departed from him, and then they didn't know him after that. No, they never knew him. They never knew him. You know, we were singing a song a little bit ago, and it, it brought to my memory of something as well. When it came to even Israel, do you know that as Jesus was approaching the end of his ministry, and Israel as a whole was rejecting the Messiah? And do you know that, that as he looked at Jesus looked at Jerusalem, he said this? He said, he said to them, how soon I would have taken you under my wings, right? So here's the point. Does God have foreknowledge of everything? Yes. Does he know who will be in Christ? Yes, he does. He's God, right? And But also this, my friend, he wants all to be saved. Just like he even looked at Jerusalem and said that statement, and he meant it. That is the will of God. That's the will of Jesus. He wanted Israel to be saved. He would have quickly thrown, thrown his wings around them and protected them, but he didn't. Why? Because they rejected Jesus. And there's no salvation outside of Jesus. So bring to light and wrap up this thought of foreknowledge real quick. Foreknowledge, again, he knows all of these things. He knows who will accept. But foreknowledge is not forecausing. What do I mean by that? Just because God knows something will happen does not mean that He makes it happen or causes it to happen. Now, there are a lot of things that God does cause to happen, right? He is sovereign. But it does not take from His sovereignty to understand this biblical truth that He does not for cause, one, sin, does he? Does he know you will sin? Yes, he does. But does he cause you to sin? No, he doesn't. We can't make a perfect, sinless God responsible for our sin because he knows we're going to sin. But think about this as well. Take this in mind. I don't know if you've thought about this before, but having the idea that God makes and forecauses people to reject his son and stay lost on the way to hell, that idea does not line up with this truth. If he did that, I'm just going to ask you, doesn't, doesn't God give all the command, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand? Doesn't he give his command, this command, time and time again, to call upon the name of the Lord, to trust in Jesus, doesn't He give that command time and time again? Does He not? He does. But if He were to cause and make certain people to not obey a command from Him, He would be responsible for sin. And He's not. He can't be. Amen? He's sinless. There's no sin in Him. So again, that's a little bit of the foreknowledge of God that this is all based on. But I'm going to bring to light another scripture, Romans 8, 29. The first section of Romans actually ties a lot in with the first section of Ephesians. He styled his writings very similar. Again, the first part, the first three chapters of Ephesians, he will tell you and let you know the riches that you have in Christ. And he'll also do that great plan of salvation and what we have in Christ in Romans before he gets to the practical for the believer. But again, what he said in Romans 8.29 is this. He says, For whom he did foreknow, those whom he foreknew, that God foreknew, that he again knew would trust in his Son. Get this, he also did predestinate. But what did he predestinate them to? It actually says it. To be conformed to the image of his son. That he might be the firstborn among brethren. And firstborn here means um, um, preeminent. 
to be the first, to be out front. Jesus is the model. Jesus is the pillar of righteousness and perfection, right? He's the standard. That's Jesus. But what did is, again, it said that truth, though. Those who he foreknew, he foreknew would trust in his son. He also predestinated, meaning he planned in advance that they would, again, those that would trust in Christ, would be conformed to the image of his son. Amen? And I'm just going to tell you, I'm glad for that plan. That get this, after he saved us, we receive the Holy Spirit of God. He is, he is making us from the inside out to grow into the image of Jesus. Amen? And the more we get into his word, the more we renew our thinking to fit the Bible, the standard, and the more we allow His Holy Spirit to live out those great truths, the more we are being renewed into the image of His Son. Amen? And I'm just going to tell you, that plan, He had a, from the beginning. He knew we would sin. That's evident too. Also in the foreknowledge that before the foundation of the world, Jesus was the Lamb slain. Amen? He knew we would sin. He knew mankind would reject Him and turn from Him. But He also planned the only way we could be saved through His Son. Amen? If you will, let's uh, break down a little bit more um, and get a, a few more ideas of this. So again... He foreknew, he did not forecause. Then also, let's bring out, again, there, there's an idea out there that he doesn't want some to be saved, but he does want some. But again, let's go to what God says. I can't take man's thought on this. I've got to go, what God have you revealed is your desire. What's your will about this topic? 1 John 2 and 2. It says, and he is the propitiation for our sins and not for our sins only, but also for the sins of the whole world. My friend, get this. Jesus came and he paid the sin debt of the whole world. Amen? Scripture says that for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Amen? It's, it's given. He loves everyone. He paid the sin debt of everyone. And He offers that to all who would believe. This brings out a little bit more description of this idea. 1 Timothy 4.10 it says, for therefore we both labor and suffer reproach. It's simply as Paul is saying, look, we are dedicated to preaching this gospel even if we suffer for it. Why? Because we trust in the living God, get this, who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. Now what does that mean? It means, get this, that God even through Jesus' sacrifice, desires to be the Savior of all men. Amen? He paid the sin debt of everyone. But this is bringing out a very important clue. It says, especially of those that believe. What does that mean? Well, one, He wants all to be saved, but get this, the blood will only be applied to those who receive Christ. Amen? The blood must be applied. This gift of salvation and forgiveness is being offered even now. And He's offering salvation to all men now, but it will only come to those that believe. Amen? What else does God say His desire is? 2 Peter 3 and 9. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward. What, what's He referring to there? Well, He's saying why Jesus hasn't come back yet. 
He's saying while Jesus is tearing his return. Why? He says. He's, he first assured you, assured you of this. He's going to keep his promise. He's coming. Amen. But get this. But he said he's long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. What did that say right there? It tells you what God's will is. He said, even in Jesus' return and the end of the age and the end of the opportunity for grace and salvation, He's tearing Jesus' return. Why? Because He wants no one to perish. Amen? We long for Jesus' coming. And we look forward to it. But Him not coming back yet shows us Just how patient He is. And it reminds us this. There's still more that need to be saved. Amen? I believe that the opportunity for man to be saved will be cut off at the last moment that he knows everyone that that could be saved has rejected And then also, of his foreknowledge, everyone that he knew would accept has opportunity to accept. There's there's going to come a time where, again, man is in rebellion now against God. Man is rejecting the Savior now. And the, the interesting thing is that all of us were there once. Amen? But now we have accepted Christ and are saved. But there's, coming, there's going to come a time where all of the world is in opposition to God. Where it is full opposition to God. But I'm just going to tell you, God is patient. He's given all the opportunity to be saved. But why drive home that point? He is not willing that any perish. But that all should come to repentance. One more verse of scripture teaches this same thing. Ezekiel 33.11 Ezekiel 33.11 What does God say here? Say unto them Say unto them As I live saith the Lord We better listen, amen I don't care what man might say It It doesn't matter what we say What man says But God says this, Say unto them, As I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. But get this, But that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye from your evil ways, for why will ye die, O house of Israel? Amen? What did God drive home there? He says, as I live, I speak this truth. You want what God's desire is on this matter? He said it right there. He does not delight that the wicked remain in their sin and die and go to hell. That's not His will. That's not His heart. That's not His desire. What is His desire? That all would repent. Amen? That none would perish, but all would repent. It is His will that you would turn from your evil way, turn back to God, trust in the only Savior, and live. Amen? I'm just going to tell you, my friend, God drives home from the beginning of the Bible unto the end His will. And our theology has to match His clear, revealed will. Amen? So my friend today, I'll tell you, God's desire, because I'm sharing what he says, is that none perish, but that all repent. Think about this. Um, So this is what we're looking at in Ephesians is actually written again to the saved. Those who have already received Christ. And we are reading it after we have accepted Christ, to see what we have in Christ. And begin, but again, he's not saying that God doesn't want that for others. I, we're not sitting here in church and 
thinking, well, I'm saved. This is what God's telling me I have. And he obviously doesn't want anyone else to have it. No, he does. Amen? That's why we're here to share the gospel. To let everyone know of that invitation. But 2 Corinthians tells of that message that we're to take out to the lost. Again, Ephesians is telling us what we have now that we are saved. But 2 Corinthians 5 is telling, telling people that are not saved yet what to do. What to do. This invitation that's being offered. So how is God's language to those that aren't saved yet? It's this. 2 Corinthians 5.20 now then, we as ambassadors for Christ, as though, get this, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. I love that. that. That verse is so rich. What that verse says right there is that, again, Paul and us as believers, God has called us to be ambassadors for Him. For the king and for the kingdom, amen? We're ambassadors. And get this, what is the king's message? The king's message is not, look, he hates the world, he doesn't want all of you to be saved. It's the opposite. He so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life, amen? And what is that message right there? Again, as ambassadors of Christ, get this. He says, as though God did beseech you by us. Beseech means urge. Compel. Beg. What that is saying right there, look. When Paul shared the gospel, when we share the gospel... He's saying it as, as though God is urging you through us, through the gospel message. It's his message. We're just relaying it as ambassadors. But can you imagine that again? Um, it is not, again, people that might think that God only wants some to be saved and some not. They would also believe that it is a fixed or irresistible grace. That when the gospel is shared they must receive it if God wants them to be saved. But here's the point, get this, is why are we told time and time again, believe, believe, trust, believe. We don't understand why some people would reject this great gospel and this salvation. I don't understand it. But I also don't understand why I for 12 years did. Amen? Amen? But here's the amazing thing is this, is that God is saying again, it, it, sadly men can resist it. Men can say no to it. As Scripture says, they, love their, they will sometimes love their sin so much they will reject the Savior. There was once a time where we loved our sin so much we rejected the Savior. But think about this. What did God say? God, through the sharing of his gospel, is urging you, begging, compelling. Would you be saved? Do you realize my love for you? I know you've sinned. I know you're in rebellion against me, but I love you and I want you to be saved. Amen? It also says, here's that message, even we pray you in Christ's stead. On behalf of Christ, we're urging you, be saved. But also it says, be ye reconciled to God. And this is what that reconciliation is, verse 21 of 2 Corinthians 5. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. I love that. What Paul is saying is, look, God is urging each and every one of you, be made right with God through Christ and Christ alone. Amen? God laid the, your sin on Jesus. He paid for the sins of the world. But get this, you will only be reconciled 
based on what you, of your free will, choose to do with Jesus. Be reconciled. Trust in Christ. Acts 2 and 21 says this, And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. That whosoever, as the song says truthfully, that whosoever meaneth me. That invitation is given to all. He wants all to be saved. He has expressed his will. But Ephesians 1 and 5, pick up into our main text. Ephesians 1 and 5 says this, Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Pause there for a moment again. Predestinated as he has made a plan in advance of what? Uh, um, he says, for us that get this, that we would be adopted as children by Jesus Christ. Again, he is simply saying, this is my plan for all who would come to Christ. And I'm just going to tell you, um, <laughs> let these riches sink in. Let the sweetness of this plan sink into you. Remember earlier that we talked about believers are ambassadors for the king? Almighty God, perfect God is king. And he's sending us out, inviting all who would believe to come into the kingdom. But I'm just going to tell you, we don't just get to come into the kingdom. As it says here, it has been planned that all who would believe in Christ would be adopted as children of God. Amen? Think about this. Our standing before God was we were at enmity. We had rejected Him. Can you imagine that? King, creator of everything, even of us. We rejected Him. We stood in opposition to His kingdom. We stood in opposition of His way of kingdom living. We rejected it and was doing life in sin, right? But can you imagine that the King loved us so much that He gave His Son to die for us that we could be saved? That we could actually come into His kingdom? But get this, He didn't just show us mercy and say, I'm not going to kill you. We deserve death. That was the wages of our sin, amen? But get this, he didn't just stop at mercy. He didn't just say, I'm going to withhold the judgment that you deserve. He went further and, and poured out grace. Amen? Us who were once in opposition to the king, he's poured out grace. Grace. And we're studying about some of that grace now. And again, I'm just going to tell you part of that grace. Again, we should just be glad, God, you didn't kill me. God, you didn't send me again to hell. An eternal separation from you because of my sin. Or that you have not allowed me to come to you and, and live in relationship with you now. So again, it wasn't just mercy, it was this. He's invited you into His family. Amen? And what an honor that is. And again, what does it say though? It was all by Christ. It was all through Christ. We didn't deserve it. We weren't just a little bit better than whoever else. No. We trusted Christ. And get this, it said, according to the good pleasure of His will. My friend, it was a joy for God to offer you that. Amen? It's not His delight that sinners stay in sin and, and die and go to hell. Not His delight. But it is His delight to offer this grace to all who would receive it. Amen. And what a great delight it is. Again, 
God's not just looking at, at us and his children and just saying, you are a mess. I, I, I can't believe I invited you into the family. He is working on us. He's given us a new heart. He's conforming us day after day into the image of his son. But here's the point. We stand before him as his children. Amen? And he loves his children. He chastens his children because he loves them. If you will, we just were able to scratch the surface and not get into all that was planned for today, but that's the truth about Ephesians. Each verse is packed full of riches. I've heard it phrased this way before, is it's like, it's like fudge, and I can relate. I used to not be able to eat any fudge hardly at all. I usually was able to get a, just a little nibble before it would make my stomach upset. Why? Because it's so rich. But my friend, richer than that are these riches that we find on every line in the book of Ephesians chapter 1. Amen. So today I stand before you and I, I ask you, where do you stand? Where is your spiritual standing before God? Are you still in sin? Are you in the first Adam? Are you lost? Are you, on, are you in wrath? Are you on your way to hell? Or have you heard that amazing invitation from God that he so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved? Have you received him? That is the only way for mankind to be saved. There's no other way. No other way. Will you stand in Christ today? Would you trust in Christ today and become, as it said, children of God? Stand before him now blameless and holy? My friend, whatever it is that God is leading you to do as we stand for a time of invitation.